Hello, hi everybody. It's HR Fest Online again, and I'm super excited because today we are talking to somebody straight from NASA. Yay! Hello, Steve. Can you introduce yourself? Because I want to hear from you what you actually do there. Sure, absolutely. Uh, it's great to have me on, Gerga. I appreciate the, the opportunity to, to be on your uh, program here. Uh, my name is Steve Rader, and I am the Deputy Director for NASA's Center of Excellence for Collaborative Innovation. And so that is a group that works across our uh, federal agency, uh, NASA, as well as other federal agencies in the U.S. government uh, to help projects use open innovation to solve problems. Uh, and so open innovation is crowdsourcing, crowdsource challenges, crowdsource freelance work, that kind of work. Wow. How can you get that kind of job? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've actually worked at NASA for uh, over 30 years, and uh, I've done many things from flight control to software development uh, to systems engineering and communications architecture. And about 10 years ago, I read Jeff Howe's book about crowdsourcing and just fell in love with crowdsourcing. It's, um, it's got some magical properties, in my opinion, and it is actually a really important uh, thing uh, that we have uh, now in this current age of rapid change that it's becoming very important for a lot of organizations. And so I, I kind of detected that early and started pouring kind of my energy into joining crowds and understanding them. And uh, that was about the same time that NASA became involved with, with open innovation and crowdsourcing. And when an opening came up, I applied because I had that passion and uh, have just kind of built on that ever since. That's, wow, that's amazing. Uh, actually, uh, that's, that's very timing for NASA because uh, what we read is that Previously, you spent many billions of dollars on uh, on big projects, but did relatively few, and uh, that's not really looking like a feasible option. And is, is is crowdsourcing kind of a solution to move towards the less expensive, more startup-wise thinking? Yeah, um, sort of. It, it's it's how do you get the most. Uh, out of the budget you have, right? And we know that uh, space exploration projects are very expensive, very risky to do, and we have a fixed budget. Our budget has, has been generous, but not growing. And so NASA does lots and lots of different kinds of projects, human space exploration, planetary missions, weather, uh, Earth-related missions, uh, aerospace, and uh, that is a lot to take on. And what we find is, that crowdsourcing is a really good way to find the latest and greatest technologies that can get us better performance, which usually has a, a monetary, so co launch costs, uh, cost of doing business, it helps us there. And then in the open talent world, um, skills are changing so fast, as you know, it's becoming increasingly hard for organizations to find the right skills at the right time and staff those positions. And so we're looking at how do we adapt just like everyone else to get the right skills on board for when we need them? Uh, and how do we upskill our own folks, right? How do we keep in the mix uh, that we're leveraging all the latest and greatest technologies uh, and expertise? And the traditional HR models uh, are kind of breaking down, right? The the idea of owning all of the people and, you know, everyone's going to work for us for years uh, and not be training and not be learning new things uh, it is getting harder and harder. And so the open model starts to really expose uh, the, the systems to a more efficient way to find the expertise we need and to find the technologies and innovations we need to move forward. And so we're trying to kind of find the right mix of all of that so that we get the biggest bang for the buck, if you will, right? That the most out of the dollars that are invested in. Sounds extremely interesting. Two, two questions come to my mind. One is, uh, you, so you hunt for it, more talent or more ideas? Yeah, both, right? So we, we have focused, right? And from our inception, we started in about 2011. 
uh, and we started with contests. So crowdsourced contests, challenges, prize-based challenges was the key uh, ingredient. And we started with Inocentive, uh, which you may be familiar with as 400,000 problem solvers, very good at technical problems. Uh, we had Top Coder, which is now grown to one and a half million software developers and data scientists. Um, and then we used Yet2 for tech search, which they have about 130,000 in their network for technology search. Um, and we have an internal crowd. We've taken uh, something called NASA at Work where we actually use IdeaScale inside NASA to really mine the ideas within the agency, mainly as a, an enterprise knowledge sharing tool. So we can post a challenge to our employees and our contractors, and if somebody's working on something or knows about something that will solve that problem, we can get that without actually having to spend a lot of money. And so that's been really effective. We have about 30,000 of our NASA employees and contractors on that platform. We started uh, very much with contests and with prizes and challenges as the model. And what we found is that when you have a problem, uh, if you've been working on that problem a while and you don't know what the answer is, crowdsourcing is a really great way to kind of find those unsuspecting innovations and solutions and technologies you might not understand are out there. And so prizes and challenges have been a great kind of matching mechanism. So it, it turns out there's a ton of technology work going on out in the world today with a lot of new skills, a lot of new expertise coming online. And in that case, um, challenges can kind of help you find those experts. So if you look at technologies, a lot of the technologies apply to all industries. So if you look at machine learning and drones and cheap sensors and robotics, almost every industry is investing in those areas. And so what happens is you're actually having new innovations in a lot of different areas, but in different industries. So agriculture may have a machine learning and drone uh, technology that they've developed, but if you're over here in say aerospace and you, you saw a presentation about that, you probably would say, oh, that doesn't apply to me because you don't understand agriculture language. You don't understand what their context is, but there are people out in the crowd who know a little bit about agriculture and a little bit about aerospace and they can connect the dots. And so crowdsourcing is really great at finding those people that know how to bring in a solution that, that you, already exists in a lot of cases or an idea that you can then go leverage. And we found this to be the case. We've done a bunch of challenges. In fact, we've done over 400 challenges. Um, and in many cases, you'll find a solution that already exists that's in use in another domain. There's a great example that Gavin McClafferty gave me out of sub C7 in the oil and gas industry where they actually uh, used to take a ship out to a, an undersea pipeline at a million US dollars a day and, and lower a van sized piece of equipment next to the pipeline to inspect it. And it would take them about two weeks to inspect a segment of pipe. And what they found when they went to Nine Sigma and did a challenge is within days, they actually discovered that the mining industry already had a handheld unit that could be used to do that same job in two hours as opposed to two weeks. That's a hundred times improvement. And what they told us was if they hadn't found it and their competitor had, they would currently be out of business. And so that's, you're seeing this kind of pattern happen where technology is advancing very rapidly. Companies, have to find those technologies if they hope to stay competitive. Otherwise, they're going to be out of business, and a lot are going out of business, right? Uh, that, that is kind of the trend. The age uh, that, that companies uh, grow to has gr gone from 60 years down to less than 20, and you know many companies are failing. Um, go ahead. No, I'm just, I'm just nodding. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so challenges started to be a really great way for us to find solutions that were already out there and to leverage 
the diversity of thought that's really necessary for innovation. Um, if you study innovation, one of the things you find very quickly are two things. Diversity is super important because if you just take the experts, they have typically already looked at all of what they know. And it's really the things that, that other disciplines bring to the table that are of value. The second part is failure. Failure is a really important part of innovation, but it's expensive. It's expensive to, to, to build something and it not work. In crowdsourcing, you actually get lots of people trying to build lots of solutions all at once, and only the winners end up winning, and that's who you pay. And so you actually get the, the advantage of many, many failures uh, without having to, to, to bear the expense. There's a great example of that where Roche Diagnostics, you know, big multi-billion dollar uh, pharmaceutical company, was trying out incentive for the first time, and they actually uh, brought their 10 biggest problems. And there's a great case study at London Business School on this, where they, they brought their 10 problems in. And one of those problems was uh, they had been working on for 15 years, and they had still not solved it. And it was to get a very precise measurement of the quantity and quality of an inlet sample for an in vitro diagnostic machine. And they brought this problem in, they put it on the Innocentive platform, I think it was about a 20,000 US dollars prize, and in 60 days, not only had they solved the problem, two different submitters, two different solvers submitted the same solution, which meant it already existed, and they just had to connect the dots. But what really shocked them was all of the failures that they had had over 15 years of proprietary research were also replicated. And so all of those things came in as submissions in that 60-day study. And so that, that, that challenge brought in uh, this, instead of taking 15 years to make all those failures, you could literally have done that in 60 days with a crowd. Uh, actually, you don't know, but we are running fuck up nights in Hungary, which is a format about failures, and uh, it's very popular. Um, yeah. Before we go to the COVID era, uh, a question that comes up my mind is that uh, what you tell me is really, really exciting. Also, opening up, loosening uh, the borders between you know companies and the, the non-company part of the whole world. Uh, all the, when we talk about these things, the question always comes up: Okay, but what about security? What about you know, protection from competitors, et cetera, et cetera. Sure, uh, definitely good questions. These are what these platforms are really doing for companies already. So it's, it's not like it's a mystery to them. We, we actually use currently 18 different crowdsourcing platforms that represent 70 million people. And each of those platforms has a different approach depending on what they're doing. So for instance, um, in software, Topcoder has a whole list of security features that they go through in reviewing code, in static code analysis, really interesting uh, aspects there. Um, and it turns out um, a lot of the bad things that happen, for instance, in software are in the, the binary code, and they don't even deal with that, right? So they only deliver the source. But it turns out that when you're developing software, if you provide that out to the crowd to review, right, and actually have people in the crowd reviewing it, a bad actor, someone who's put code in that's malicious, has a really hard time hiding from everyone else who's incentivized to find those problems. And so there's those kinds of models. Um, a lot of the crowds are based on reputation, and they have a lot of data about reputation. So you can actually select a freelancer or someone in the crowd that will sign an NDA that you have, you know, five, 10 years of background information on, and you can build kind of the same case you do for an employee. Um, there's actually work going on at Topcoder right now uh, in other crowds as well to actually provide a much more robust background check with the, the same kinds of thing that HR departments do and I think part of this is companies and organizations have a mindset that if I have an HR department and they do the background check and I bring someone in, then I'm home free and I can trust that person with all of my intellectual property. But the reality is 
people share key codes all the time. They let people in. They're uh, susceptible to social engineering. Um, and so you have more risk than you think in your own workforce, and you typically oversubscribe your risk for the crowd. Yes, if you just posted something out to the public, that would be problematic. But these curated communities have actually started addressing these, and they have ways to verify who it is, where they're coming from, get all the information that you normally would. Uh, and so they're really addressing these. And then you can actually look at the products as well. The other thing I would say on this um, is that intellectual property, sometimes you worry about just putting a challenge where people will see your product. And there's some really great examples of how these companies have learned to obscure the challenge so that you actually don't know what you're working on. So there's uh, two examples I'll use. One was a potato chip company that wanted to get the grease, uh, the oil off of the potato chips as part of the manufacturing process without breaking the chips. They would vibrate the tray of chips and many of the, the crisps would, would break, right? And, and that was not good. And so they ran a challenge uh, on one of these platforms and the platform, the first thing they did uh, for two reasons, one was to obscure that it was a potato chip company is they reworded the challenge how do you remove a viscous fluid from a delicate wafer? And by doing that, now I don't even know it's a potato chip, right? The other thing that that did, by the way, is that actually opened up the challenge to a lot of other diverse uh, disciplines, right? It ended up, by the way, that a violinist won that challenge with a, a, a vibration solution. It's a whole other story. But what's, what's really fascinating is they have these techniques. Another one was um, actually posted on Topcoder, where the challenge was to, act, and it was to find uh, and track a single buffalo in Yellowstone National Park using only social media uploads, right? And they ended up with this really great algorithm. Well, it turns out that the real customer for that was the CIA, and they were trying to track Russians in Crimea, and that was... That was how they did it. They, they used that algorithm. And so it, 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 there are ways to kind of obscure and protect the intellectual property. There are ways uh, that these companies know that's, that's how they're making their business, right? And so they've come up with many techniques that can be used for companies that are interested in this. Most of them see it as very different. And often uh, they use that excuse for why they're not going to use the crowd oh, I'll give away my intellectual property. What they don't realize is there are already many companies using this successfully to be more competitive. And they're just not talking about it because it's their competitive edge. And so, you know, why, why would they share? That's, that's one of the reasons I enjoy talking about this because I feel that we uh, as a public uh, entity uh, can talk about it in ways that others can't. So you are you're an evangelist, and yeah. I, and I knew that the sooner or later uh, the three letters of CIA will come up. Uh, <laughs> have to. Okay, yeah, so so it's really exciting, uh, and what happens now? So we are in a, in a crisis where it's not just an economic crisis, but yep. all kinds of previously had assumptions are gone. And, uh, yep. and we are in a world which is, I hate, I hated this, uh, you know, future of work. It's so much, ev everything is the future of work or nothing is yep. the, so what is the future? Yep. We talked with Steve Ambrose and, and it's his favorite. It's like, uh, and, uh, now, but now we really live in a, in an area where, in an era where it is really going to be different. Yep. What, what about this whole topic now, what do you think is different? What will change? What will uh, be? Yeah. Do, so, do? so one of the things that we discovered um, in our kind of journey through this is when we were looking at crowdsourcing challenges, we found that there were other communities that, that were doing freelance work, like freelancer.com does, does contests, but then they also do freelance work. And we started finding that that communities were the magic piece of this, right? Communities were coming together around expertise and around work. Um, 
and how you found those people was uh, was kind of different. So the fundamentals were someone has a need, someone has a resource, and you're trying to connect those things, right? And in the freelance world, a lot of times that's now being done with machine learning or bidding. And in the challenge world, that's done with a contest, right? And, and it just depends on what your problem is. When we started looking at that and started seeing the freelance uh, and the gig work economy, we, we found a couple of really surprising things that we didn't know. Um, one was that there's a huge migration going on of workers from full-time traditional employment into the gig marketplace full-time. So, it started with a few people being able to do part-time work or get a little, you know, a little side work. Um, but then more and more people started moving. And in fact, there's a study out of Upwork that was done by uh, Edelstein Intelligence that shows that by 2027, there may be more full-time freelancers than people that work for normal companies. And if you look around, you actually see the signs, right? Uh, WeWork was the biggest office space holder in New York City and Paris and London. Those are all freelancers, right? That's a big shift. And, and for HR, that's a big shift. For companies, that's a big shift. Uh, and for workers. But as we've been studying it, what we've noticed is a couple of things. One, remote work for digital workers is a big part of that and the enablement of remote work. Um, and now that we're in COVID uh, and this lockdown, that has become a huge savior, right? That, that people can actually continue to be productive. And knowledge workers, I would argue, have not really suffered the way people in traditional roles that had to be face-to-face -face have. Um, and, and there's always going to be differences in that. But but that the companies that already did remote work, that already understood kind of digital platforms uh, have progressed well. And I think that's, that's been an eye opener for some. The other big part of this though um, is, is automation, right? And AI, which is the other fear people have is that that's going to take all the jobs, right? What, what we've seen is it's always taken the jobs. That's not the problem, it's the rate. It's how fast the transition is happening. And so the, the speed at which technology and automation are coming through is really the problem. And what the, for workers, what we've got to find is how do we keep the workforce on pace with the new jobs that are created by automation? Because it does. Every time it destroys tasks, it creates more, but it's doing it at a speed now that the old model doesn't work, right? So the old model was, I'm a company, I go acquire the talent, that's how we talk about it, right? You acquire the talent, you keep that talent for a long time, and you might do a little bit of development, but that development is really minor, right? The average training budgets, uh, I think is something like a thousand US dollars per year per employee, and that's mostly compliance, right? That you're not really keeping your employee base up with the latest and greatest. And so the old model was keeping the workforce from actually adapting. And if you look at freelancers, freelancers only work um, a portion of their time and the other parts of their time they're learning. I talked to one of the top freelancers at Top Coder and I asked him the question, how much time do you spend of your time working versus how much do you spend of it learning? And he said he was, learning 60% of the time. A company's not geared to do that, right? But that's what's necessary to keep up. Maybe not quite that much. I mean, he was the lead guy and it tells you something about that. And I asked him, how do you even make money? And he said, well, I, with that 40% of the time, he still makes six times the average salary of Greece, which is where he lives. So the freelance economy is not what people think it is. A lot of people think it's Uber driving, but it is everything and you really can do whatever your passion is as a freelancer and instead of the old model of freelancing where you had to do all the marketing you had to find your own clients you had to do all that and that took that was hard to do these new platforms like upwork freelancer top towel maven they're doing the matching right and so 
they are giving a constant stream of work to these people. Uh, and as their reputation grows, they get more and more valuable work, right? And there's actually a crowd called Paro IO in the US that is an accounting and finance crowd where they use machine learning to match the clients to the, to the work, to the workers. But when they do it, they not only find the best worker that matches, but they actually create a, a situation where they, they find it to where it will be a challenge for that worker. And then they provide some support so that by the time they finish that task, that worker is actually going to be smarter. So it builds in the upskill and the education because they're using machine learning, because they're collecting that data. And that is much more powerful if you think about it. If we had lots of platforms that were upskilling everyone, so it, for instance, if Uber was actually set up to every time someone drove, they actually got a little bit other you know, knowledge task training as they were going, then they would eventually not need to do Uber driving. As, and so as the automated cars come in and self-driving cars, they now can move on. You can kind of see how that could cascade through the work world and be able to adapt at this rate that we, we have coming at us, right? This rate of change. And to me, that's the thing that's really got to be there is lifelong learning built into an agile workforce that can actually adapt to the changing marketplace and the changing demand of work, uh, which is now global, right? It's no longer just local. The thing about crowdsourcing that, that is surprising to people is it is both global and hyper-local all at the same time. In other words, I can reach somebody all the way across the world to help them help me on a task, but if I need someone at my house, I can also get that, right? And Uber's a great example of that. So all of those things work together. It's also not that freelance labor is this like one-time thing, right? It's that some freelancers I can reach out to and never talk to again, and that's fine. But freelancers or workers that I like, I can build relationships with and, and treat, you know, just like an employee. The big thing that's got to happen is kind of a shift in the decoupling of companies and workers, because at least in the U.S., there's, there's a lot of benefits, right, that come with a company. And that actually ends up keeping people in jobs that they hate, right? People are staying for the health benefits or they're staying for the retirement. If we just paid people outright and they actually funded those things or governments did, right? In, in a lot of countries where healthcare and retirement are part of the infrastructure, then you start to get a, an economy where people can pursue their passion, multiple passions, and be much more agile and uh, resilient to changes as they come. And I think if you look at what's happened in COVID, you know, we had one day, literally like a week, right? Where suddenly all the restaurant workers were out of work and all of the grocery stores needed to double their staff. Well, if you actually were already set up where those people were members of, of these communities, you could literally redeploy people in a day. You could say, hey, you're already pre-qualified for this. You've done this, great. We're gonna have you over here. We'll do a little training and you're ready to go. And so I think really this decoupling of the workforce from the people or from the companies rather, and starting to umbrella them in really what I think of as a new HR, right? In other words, taking the HR and the middle management out of companies, because what, what does HR and middle management do, right? Their job is to optimize human resources towards the mission of that organization, right? And middle managers, same thing. They are to, to actually assign people tasks to actually make sure that they're fully utilized and, and do the work of the company. Well, if that same, if, if you had a reduced set, that was actually using freelance types for most of that work, then all of the tasks get split. Now the human development stuff goes on over here in the platform and people actually are pursuing what they care about the most. And you're always as a company getting matched with what you need the most without paying 
overhead for extra. And so you start to get into this, this area where if you can believe in the people and the trust is built up in digital trust mechanisms like you were talking about um, in these platforms, now companies can benefit from that while individuals can also benefit. But it, it's just starting there. I think COVID just is speeding things up because it's showing people what's possible uh, and what's optimal. Wow. <laughs> that was exciting because you basically touched so many things that we could, we could fill a whole conference with, uh, with you, basically. Uh, a few things came to my mind. Number one is uh, maybe even Steve uh, Ambrose said, uh, or, or somebody I talk, spoken to, I, so, I'm sorry not to remember, but she's, he said, uh, it's not uh, artificial intelligence that's going to get uh, people's jobs. It's somebody using artificial intelligence who is going to get their jobs. That is absolutely right. Uh, the second and, thing, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, I mean, the, the AI component of this is really the enabler, right? It is going to start enabling people to be matched with the things they want to do and that are most beneficial. So you can start to see a world where you start plugging in, I like to do these things, I have done these things, this is my preference, and then being matched. That's that, the AI that Paro IO is using, that is what it's doing. He basically has a dashboard, Steve, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I just, uh, Mike Burdick, who is the CEO of Paro, he sets up a dashboard where each freelancer says what their goals are, what they want to get out of this, and that is fed back into the AI. And you can start to see that really almost with school children, right, where you start to actually design lifelong learning into the education system where people are being matched with where they are skill-wise, with what they desire and what they want to get out of things. And all of that can be played together uh, and, and even socially matched, right? Finding other people that are at that same level to actually connect you with. And you can see it all the way through how AI and people using AI to actually make these connections starts to reduce the friction uh, and to actually make better uh, solutions and better utilization. Yeah, so then I think that basically that's the future of work, that work becomes not companies, work becomes a fluid amalgamation yeah. of uh, all kinds of, uh, yeah, which is extremely exciting. Uh, listening to you, COVID and the whole terrible thing, okay, let's, let's just be clear. Uh, that it's a terrible thing. A lot of people will suffer, not so much health-wise, but economy-wise, but let's yep. put that for a while aside. We all know that, and, but, but once we, we look at the effect of how we do the work and how we rearrange ourselves, maybe what happened is actually a boost or kickstart, yeah. or I don't know. Yeah, yeah I think it's... Um change is hard right especially when you've had a hundred plus years of one model for how employees work at companies right that we have built and tuned people think that is the only way things work you know a 40-hour week and and kind of hr and and i have an office and we've started to see oh that that isn't necessarily how it's always been done right it's only a few hundred years old um and this new future starts to actually look much brighter if you start to look at it in this view of what's possible because i i often joke with some of the people that we're going to look back on this time and think a couple of things one we're going to regret asking our children what they want to be when they grow up because that is such a limiting thing and how can you possibly know because things are going to change so fast and that it's really, how are you going to learn to discover all of the amazing things that you're going to be able to do? And how are you gonna weave that together into a diverse portfolio that is robust? Because, I, you know, I'm, I play in a big band. I um, love construction. I work, do software. I like all of those things. Why, why can't I do some of all of that and some of it makes a lot of money, some of it makes a little money. All of those things can be woven together. Um, 
And by the same token, I think we're going to look back on the resume and the CV and say, wait, you used to hire people to come and work for you for years based on a couple of sheets of paper that described at a very high level, like we are going to have so much data and so much really rich data from the digital exhaust that we create when we work. And I think the real challenge of today and the real, the real pivotal time we are it, is we're in this time where things are changing. No, no one's pushing this move to the gig economy. It's happening naturally. So the real challenge for us as thought leaders is to bring people together around what are the issues that are going to come out of this? How can this be misused? Where are the potholes that are going to really take people down? And one of those is privacy. And one of those is where is all this data? If I work on one platform and they're recording all this data that their machine learning can, can use to match my, my, uh, me to a task, who owns that data? Well, if I decide to switch platforms, can I take that data with me? Is it portable? And if it's not, am I having to start over building my entire reputation? That's a big deal, right? And so, for instance, uh, uh, Mike Morris at Top Coder, uh, along with uh, Messenger, is they are, Dave Messenger, are building a, a new concept for kind of a third party ownership of data. In other words, repositories where all of your CV data gets placed and all of your training certifications get placed that you can't edit because if you could edit it, then it would be invalidated and you could just boost your own resume, right? But that someone is a custodian of, secures, and, and uses to actually uh, provide information to companies and receive information from companies. That kind of an architecture is going to be super important and starts to provide the opportunity to potentially reclaim our privacy, right? Because right now, all these companies own all of our data, and we have no control. Now, there, there's been the, the GPR uh, stuff at, uh, in Europe that's been a, a great step forward, but people still really don't own all of their data. And so an idea where we start to move to a real architecture where people really own their data and you know, blockchain con smart contracts could be used to really negotiate with uh, entities for that data and use of that data, that starts to get really exciting. Um, there are lots of legal issues that have to be worked out, right? A lot of freelance work ended up having um, blocking legislation, if you will, because the traditional model was trying to be protected. People didn't want that to be eroded. And I get that, but the problem with that is the traditional model is doomed it cannot keep up with the changes. And so if we grasp tightly to a 40 hour work week where a company pays all of our you know, benefits and we, we have a paycheck every week and it's reliable, that it sounds secure, but we've already seen massive layoffs, massive failures of companies, uh, the, the, the destruction of, of all sorts of retirement plans, because it's not sustainable. It's not that it, it is a big, scary change, right? To think about not having a paycheck every week. Like that is terrifying. But if you look at the data for people that have gone full time freelance, over half of those people have come back and said, There is no amount of money you could pay me to bring me back to work for a company. And so, I think that the idea here is there really is more security than people know in the global economy. There is, there's lots of demand out there. It's just you have to learn how to go build a reputation to find the platforms to actually do this. I often think that the 40-hour the work week has kind of domesticated our wild animal, right? We've forgotten how to hunt. We don't, we don't know how to hunt for our food. And, and so... We have to relearn how to go and find the work that is, is good for us. And once you've kind of built those reputation and found the platforms, then it just kind of comes to you, right? So it, it, it starts to be something. 
we can't count on everyone being an entrepreneur. That is not possible. We have to look at these platforms and find the ways that the platforms and the lifelong learning is available for everyone and that everyone at every part of our society gets the benefit and that they get it. So we, we, we really, if we're going to watch out for things, I think those are the things we have to watch out for is making sure that this is an equitable access system, that we are providing lifelong learning opportunities for everyone. Absolutely. And uh, uh, listening to you and imagining that COVID came 20 years ago, that would have been much more difficult and much more different than now because all these tools and technology was not a non-existent. So actually, we, in a stupid way, we are lucky that it, it came now. I, I totally agree. Like there just is uh, this, this timing um, is going to actually be, I think we are going to look back on it and think it was horrible, like you say, and it kick-started some changes that people were dragging their feet on. And there will still be people that don't adopt and don't adapt, but they're not going to be around in 10 years. Like it's, they are naturally going to be, go away because um, AI and this new model and the, it can actually take advantage of those changes rather than suffer from them. And the old model will only suffer from the rapid changes. Absolutely. Well, what I liked a lot uh, in your previous uh, uh, comment was that we will look back on this time. And that what I, I came to my mind is that we will look back on this time and think those were the times when a lot of people hated it, his job. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think people will say everyone was miserable in their yeah, job. Not, not everyone, not everyone, but, but I will say even at NASA, where we have super interesting jobs and really brilliant people, large organizations kind of suck your soul, right? Because, um, because you can't pursue what you're most passionate about. Um, you're part of a team and you're part of another effort and you have a bureaucracy, right? The average productivity for an employee in an organization is three out of every eight hours, so 37%. And the rest of it isn't that people are being lazy. It's just that they're either not assigned the right work or they are in meetings being wasted or they're doing bureaucracy. And then for companies, there's all this overhead, right? Something like two to three times an employee's salary goes to IT, HR, legal, security, office space. All of that kind of evaporates. And so I think there's a natural market force that's going to take what companies really need to do, which is focus on uh, what Mike Morris said, I think the other day was really, you never wanna outsource your thinking, right? They actually are gonna have the core of what is it that we're trying to do and who do we need to do it? And then just bringing in uh, who you need when you need them, but not capturing them so they can't do anything else. Like that's not, why would you do that? It's, it's, it's not helpful to them and it's actually not helpful to you because you need them to be experiencing things in other uh, companies. There's another piece to this that's been very interesting in the intellectual property uh, world. And that is um, in the last 20 years uh, or 20 years ago, people really made their money off of intellectual property. And so you found it, and then you made money off of it for 20, 30 years, right? And things have started changing so fast that and, and, and the, the, what companies would do there is they would pursue capturing as much of the intellectual property as they can. It didn't matter how small it was, they wanted to capture it because it could potentially be a money source. What we're seeing in newer companies is they only focus on IP that is strategic and will really have a long-term benefit. And they recognize that investing in trying to get patents on just everything is wasteful because by the time you get through the patent process, the likelihood that that technology is even still relevant is low. And so a lot of companies have, have really changed the way they're looking at intellectual property. And so that's why a lot of this crowd stuff is less threatening to, to some of the more cutting edge uh, companies because they see 
yes, they have certain things that they have to hold close, but it's not everything. And you can get a whole lot done with an open workforce uh, and not have all those concerns. So it's a really interesting uh, aspect of this that, that we're watching. That was amazing. That was exactly what I expected from you, or even more. <laughs> so thank you very, very much. Uh, we touched so many interesting things that uh, my mind is actually, you know, exploded. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I hope we will, uh, there will be nicer times when we can actually invite you to Hungary, uh, hopefully next year, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> We don't have to wait you for you to come with a spaceship. Uh, but it was really, really exciting. And it's so good to hear how you portray the future as, a, as, a, as an optimistic and, uh, and a more happier future. Yeah. Well, I, I think we have an opportunity to realize that. And it's going to take some work to do it. Uh, but. I'm excited at the possibility of what we can make. And I, I realize it, it can come off as utopian and idealistic. And, and I, I know that it's not going to be all roses and, and beauty, but we have an opportunity for people to live into a much better world. And I'm excited about it. So thank you for giving me a chance to, to share that. Absolutely. And I think uh, it might sound uh, utopistic or too optimistic, but, but at last, the first time in the, the history of humankind, we do have the tools to, to, to really make it happen. So, so now we really have a chance and that, that's, that's super empowering. Thank you very yeah. much. Have a great day. Go launch a spacecraft. <laughs> uh, Thank you. And, and I enjoy care. it. Ciao. Thanks.